My electronic band slash duo, Cyberspace Oblivion, played our first live show in early December last year. Since our formation, we'd always planned to perform our music in front of people. Only problem is, whilst we've written and recorded a lot of music, we didn't know how to actually play any of it. We'd regularly have freeform jam sessions, but performing live, we wanted to play the actual tracks from our one released album, as well as a few tracks from the other upcoming albums, which are still in the works. The scale and logistics of pulling all of this together was enough that we'd put it off for a while whilst getting onto other things. Performing live with any style of music takes a lot of preparation. Creating and refining arrangements to work for the instruments available, to then learning and practicing those arrangements to the point you can perform them confidently is generally very time and energy intensive. Both myself and my bandmate Cyber have been in bands before, so we already had a pretty thorough understanding of that aspect of live preparation, but what neither of us had any experience with was working out how to translate the pieces we'd constructed entirely within a door across to a doorless synthesizer setup. Back when I bought the Digitact, I chose it for a number of reasons. One of which was that it was versatile enough to be the brain for the type of live show we wanted to do. It might just be some form of mind rot, but I believe that performing live should have as many elements occurring live as possible. I never understood electronic musicians who perform their music like a DJ. Sure, it's possible and ultimately a lot simpler, but I believe the challenge and complexity are a big part of what adds life and interest to the performance. Just to be clear, I've got nothing against DJs. I see DJing as a very valid art form, it's just that it's a different art form with different aims. So, where possible, we wanted to play parts in live, deferring the rest of the parts to MIDI from the Digitact, and having the live sound design be a major aspect of the performance as well. There would inevitably be a part here or there that would need to be played back as a sample, but we'd have a physical synth for each sound as much as possible. Given how much work was cut out for us, we procrastinated on this for a while, focusing our efforts instead towards recording our second album. But then we finished recording the second album and we're out of excuses. So we made a plan and set a deadline, giving ourselves a month to prepare for a live show. We made this plan at the start of November and set the date for our show to be on the 1st of December. We decided to do it as a house show out of Cyber's garage, so on the 6th of November we packed down all of the Simpson gear from mine and transported it all to Cyber's. These were all the Simpson gear we'd have to perform our music on. That's the Digitact, Matrix Brute, Juno 106, K2, MS20, Microbrute, Volca FM2, and Midas MR18 Mixing Desk. The decision to make it a house show was primarily due to the complexity and uncertainties involved with the setup, and we figured doing it as a house show would help simplify things since it meant our performance space was also our practice space. Meaning we wouldn't have to do an entire setup on the day of performance which would be a massive job and the source of potentially endless headaches and technical problems. The next day, on the 7th of November, we set up all of the synths and equipment and got everything patched in. We worked out all of the tracks we wanted to play, although it wasn't until a few days later that we decided on the exact set list order to play them in. On the 8th of November, realizing we'd underestimated our table space needs, we went to the local tip to pick up an extra table and as well I brought a spare table from mine and we inserted them into the setup. This is one aspect of our setup which is extremely question mark for performing at a venue. Will I ever need to utilize tables available at the venue? Risky or work out a solution involving a folding table or some unknown third option. <laughs> if you know any good solutions, please let me know in the comments. Anyways, from here we made sure everything was patched in and all the midis were communicating properly. <laughs> Over the following weeks, we got right into the technical stuff, working out patches and bringing tracks into song mode. To construct this video, I initially wanted to bring you through this all chronologically, but for the sake of clarity and efficiency, I've decided against that. Here's the non-linear breakdown of everything that happened. One, song mode. We got all the relevant MIDI tracks and samples loaded into the Digitact for each song. For a lot of tracks, this was relatively simple. We tracked down the Ableton song page for each song and transcribed the MIDI across from there. For simpler parts, it was faster to program them in note by note using the MIDI keyboard. For more complex patterns, we'd send the MIDI track directly into Ableton to record into the Digitac sequencer. This worked pretty well for most songs, except when pushing the sequencer beyond its limits. There's an arpeggiation slash sequencing technique we like to use involving tons of notes in highly specific, complex arrangements. This is a problem for the Digitac sequencer. So for most other parts, we can compress the MIDI information down to a few patterns, but for these very complex parts, every single note needs to be put into the sequencer, and we have far more notes than can be handled simply by the Digitac sequencer. 
What we ended up doing was chaining a few banks worth of patterns together to record all of the notes into, just to give you a sense of scale. There's 16 patterns per bank, and each project on the Digitact has 8 banks. So these more complex songs took up a quarter of the entire available sequence of space of a project, compared to the 2 to 4% of the space required for the other songs. Recording across this many patterns allowed us to record the entirety of these parts in, but there were still some issues. So we split some of the MIDI up across two tracks instead of just one, halving the resolution needed from the Digitact, but also doubling the Digitact's MIDI tracks used per sim. The alternative would have been to use twice as many patterns. One other thing I should mention is that these parts are in stereo, meaning two different complex complementary sequences are being sent to two hard pan synths. So these parts ended up requiring four MIDI tracks from the Digitact, leaving only four other MIDI tracks for the rest of the synths. Fortunately, this wasn't an issue and we didn't need more than those four MIDI tracks on those songs. So after all of the MIDI parts for a song had been transferred into the Digitact, we used song mode to program in all the arrangements and moved on to the next track, doing this for every track in the setlist. Two. Delegation of parts. Since for our albums, we record almost exclusively with the Matrix Brute. This meant we'd need to work out which synth would handle each part. Some of these decisions were pre-made for us. Those stereo sequences I mentioned before, since that part requires two synths doing the exact same sound, those were only ever going to be assigned to the MS-20 and K2. Although not perfectly identical in this context, they work very effectively as a match for each other. Other parts were more difficult to assign, but certain practicalities forced our hands. On the song Escape Velocity, there's a big bass bit which uses oscillator sync and one of the oscillators is being pushed up and down the octave. This is a sound we couldn't effectively pull out of any synth other than the Matrix Brute. There was another sound which used a sync delay, also a sound we could only properly get out of the Matrix Brute. We went back and forth on which of those sounds would be on the Matrix Brute for a while, eventually giving it to the bass and giving the synced delay sound to the Micro Brute, as even though it couldn't really reproduce the sound exactly, it was good enough and the bass part is more important for that song. Certain songs required less complex fast arpeggiation and those parts could be sent to the matrix brute as chords which could trigger the internal arpeggiator all corded slash pad slash polyphonic sounds were sent to the Juno by default, sometimes to the FM if the Juno was already doing something. For almost every song there was a different synth doing the various parts. Bass, lead, arpeggiation parts all cycled around to different synths based on the specific needs of each song. This created certain challenges we'd need to account for with the mixing, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. Three. Patches. Not only did we need to work out patches for each song, but we also needed a means of documenting and recalling them live. So working out the patches for each song was pretty simple. We'd basically just play the song over and over again, tweaking our sounds until we were happy with them. Our patch storing methods up until this stage had been reasonably informal. Matrix, Brute, Juno, Volca, FM, and Digitact are simple as they store their settings internally, so all you have to do is store all of their preset info together for each song. You can even send patch change information from the Digitact, something we tried using but decided not to use for this show. The Matrix Brute could only handle a few patch changes before refusing to respond, and the whole system seems just that bit too unreliable. Manually selecting presets, even across multiple synths, is reasonably fast. But for the synths without internal presets, the Micro Brute, K2, and MS-20, we needed a way to store and recall each knob position. Historically, we'd just take photos with our phones, this worked well enough in a jamming context, but not for a live setting. The solution we landed on was printing out patch sheets we could draw on for each song, noting down any and all relevant knob positions per song. This worked well enough, but there was still no getting around to the need to pause between songs whilst changing our patches. Once a synth was finished with its parts for one song, it could be set for the next song though, so we were able to save some time between songs that way. I suspect with practice we'd be able to reduce the time between songs even further, but using presetless analog synths to perform sort of just requires time between songs. The other solution would be to keep some sort of drone or background sound we could raise up between songs and fade down as songs start so there's at least no dead air and shitty banter. Um, so this is uh, normal, normal friendly banter. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very normal. Um, it's, Don't it's, be afraid. <laughs> yeah, it's not not forced. Um, <laughs> it's not because it takes us a hot minute to change our patches between songs. It's for different reasons. And, and so, yeah, I was gonna say, are you gonna entertain us? Somehow? No, no actually, sorry. Um, I apologize if I misled you. That's not. What yeah, I'm saying. Just like, <laughs> sing tequila. It always works when I do shit. Play it on the other 
Whilst we have a working solution for patches, there's definitely still room for improvement. Also, if you know of a better method than what we're doing, please drop it in the comments. Love to know. Four, mixing desk integration. Why am I saying it like that? Four, mixing desk integration. Getting the mixing desk talking to the Digitact was crucial to getting things to actually sound at all decent. A bass sound needs to be handled and processed in a manner which is far different than a lead. And each synth is changing roles almost every single song. If we couldn't find a way to do automation on the mixing desk, everything was going to sound just awful. The panning of each synth would need to be different for almost every song, along with the EQ, compression, effects, reverbs and delays, volumes, etc. So the changeover between songs was already going to be complex enough with the patch changes, but on top of that we needed to be making radical changes to the mixing desk settings, which would have more than doubled, if not tripled, or even quadrupled the time between songs. Not good. When the previous desk we'd been using, the Personas AR16 died, we chose to replace it with the Midas MR18 desk. The initial primary use was for recording our jams, as well as for album recording, but we also chose it with live integration in mind. Its lack of physical controls is kind of annoying, having to network in with a phone or computer to interact with it, but it can receive instructions over MIDI. So we set the Digitact up to send specific patch change information to the desk at the start of each song, which unlike with the Matrix Brute, worked reliably. With that working, it was time to dial in the mix. Now, even though I do live sound engineering as a job, there was no way I was going to mix from on stage. Some people do it, but I think it's a bad strategy for so many reasons. First, you're not hearing what's coming out of the speakers. Our headphones have the front of house mix in them, but even still, headphones and speakers sound entirely different. Second, if I'm focusing on playing, there's no way I would notice the kinds of nuances of relative levels and balance and frequency across the whole mix, or be able to even attend to them in a timely manner. Mixing and playing are really two very different, unrelated headspaces. So I brought in another sound engineer to handle the front of house, and we spent a few hours the day before the show running through each track, getting things dialed in and saving the presets on the desk that the Digitact would then trigger at the start of each song. It simplifies their job on the day as well, since we already did the sound check, and it's just a matter of writing faders for each individual song. Five, PA speakers and lights. Again, I'm not sure why I'm going so ham on, okay, five. PA speakers and lights. I was able to borrow some PA speakers and lights from the lovely people I regularly work with doing live sound. Being in such a small concrete space is acoustically not ideal, but that mostly just meant we couldn't turn things up too loud, and due to it being a house show and neighbors existing, we didn't really want to make things too loud anyway. We set the speakers up on the 28th of November, then we set up the lights on the 29th of November. The lights were all networked together for a DMX system which was controlled from an iPad. The iPad can run programs out to the lights so that things change dynamically. My understanding is that there's a way to connect the lights up via MIDI, possibly to do program or scene changes or maybe with even more complex CC integration. It's something we'd be interested in trying to implement in the future, but changing the programs on the iPad every song or two was about as much as we could handle without bringing in a dedicated lighting person. VHS visuals. My god. VHS visuals. So I worry about the attention spans of people on a number of levels. One, I'm just concerned for everyone, including myself, that losing our attention spans might be somehow bad for us, but in a more practical, immediate sense, I don't want the audience to get bored or lose engagement during the performance. So taking a note from sluggish content, I figured it would make sense to give people something to engage them visually along with the music. So I set up my cathode ray tube television in front of our setup so we could play a video through it. For the first album, we commissioned a visual artist friend of mine, Ian Fleming, to put together a video which could go along with the music. They also did the cover art. Great artist. If you have a budget and are looking to commission art for a project, you should definitely hit them up. Their contact info is in the description. So I took that album video, intercut it with some of the trippy AI footage I'd been playing with in my spare time, and recorded it to a VHS tape. Reason I added the AI footage in was that the album video was shorter than our live set and I didn't want it to just loop as I figured it might get repetitive and this whole exercise is based on the premise that people might not have attention spans. We have some other ideas for interesting visuals that were too complex to figure out and implement for this show. So in the spirit of keeping things simple, we went with just the VHS visuals. Then the day arrived and all was ready. We let our audience in and played a show it to them. It went well, we didn't fully nail all of the songs, but we played a live show, which is something we didn't know how to do before all of this. We've posted videos of some of the performances on the Cyberspace Oblivion Band channel, omitting the songs we didn't 
fully nailed. If you're interested in watching them, you can check them out on our band's channel. Anyways, I'm curious to hear your general thoughts and opinions in the comments as well. If you've played electronic music live, I'd be very interested in hearing about your experiences or notable challenges you've had and how you've dealt with them. Also, I'm very curious to know if there are any obvious rookie mistakes that we're making genuine question it would be great to know so we can stop making them also just want to plug my patreon real quick uh there's bonus content there i made along with this video where i do a breakdown of the production of cyberspace oblivion's first album rogue planet i've also posted all of the matrix brute patches used for that album on the patreon as well so if you're a matrix brute user and want to use the sounds i put together for that album you can by signing up to my patreon oh and if you're into discord I have a Discord. Okay, bye.